Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I must say, when you invited me to give this uh, lecture, I thought maybe you're telling me something about my health. <laughs> and this might be it. Or telling me something about my position at SUTD, and this might be it, one or the other of these, right? So thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to have seen such a large audience, and I hope it'll be a, a little enjoyable and fun, uh, the lecture that I'll be giving today. Um, you know, there's the famous last lecture, at which uh, I presume some of you have seen or heard about, and uh, it was quite moving, uh, quite important. In fact, the author of that wrote a book, and it was on the bestseller list for 112 weeks, in the best a, book, a book on bestseller. Uh, today will not be that good, right? So <laughs> nothing, nothing is going to be, I think, as emotional. Uh, nothing is going to uh, make it to the bestseller list but hopefully it'll be a little bit of fun, right? And so what I hope to do is talk a little bit about several things and then maybe have some time for conversation, discussion, if we can. So um, I thought on occasion of, uh, uh, at some point, about writing three books, which I think I'll never write, right? Three books, which I never write. And uh, the first one I call, I profess. And so I profess is I'm a professor and I admit to all my things I've done in my life, right? In terms of that could be a little bit of, and this talk today will be a little bit of I profess in terms of that. The second would be the book of failures. Uh, I've been around a long time, done many things, and failed at many, many things. And I've actually had some colleagues of mine, when I've talked to them, I said, you should really write a book about your failures because I think we'd all learn from it. And I'll, imp I'll uh, imbue some of the, that was in this talk today as well. So I'll talk a little bit about failures. It will maybe some sets. And then the third book I might like to write at some point would be a book about SUTD, right? And the book about SUTD would be You Can Hit High by Aiming Low. We set out to create one of the world's great universities uh, to be among the best, the best in technology and design. And we set out with this ambitious, huge goal of doing that. Uh, to, uh, and because if, we set, if you, can't, if you can't, don't set for high goals, you don't hit high goals, right, in some ways. So that would be the story. So this one might have a little bit of a flavor of all three of these books in one way or another. So I'm going to uh, give the talk in three different components. The first is a little bit of the history of my life and hopefully give you some sense of why I am I, who I am, right, and I think in the spirit of the last lecture, right, in terms of this. Uh, the second will be prof. And this is either thinking of my professional career or me as a professor. So it's got sort of two meanings, prof. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then at the end, which I think is in the spirit of the last lecture, what do we make of all this, right? Are there any lessons to be learned, any advice to be given, all these type of things. So I must say, I always have some trepidation about giving advice to people, right? Uh, hopefully one can serve as a little bit of a role model, but not just give explicit advice. So I'm gonna start with a, um, a picture. Uh, first, then, why am I? Uh, that's me. <laughs> oh, so cute. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Looks just like me, doesn't it? Wouldn't you say? So that was me at, uh, I think, about eight months or so. Uh, you notice a couple things. One is I was quite hefty, right? Quite hefty at the time. And secondly, you're, there's a ball sitting down there. And uh, that ball is going to come back in various v v views throughout the uh, course of this presentation, right? But balls, uh, an important part of my life. So I was, uh, I was born long, long time ago. In fact, I think no one in this audience was alive when I was born. I think that's a true statement. Right? I think it's a true statement, right? <laughs> Certainly none of the students were. Right? I think none, none, no one. So the year was 1945, so 71 years ago. It's a long, long, long time ago. And so I thought I'd start with just some few things about 1945. I mean, clearly the big event is this was the end of World War II, right? this great world war. Uh, the atomic bomb had been launched at that, at the, in that year. And as a result of the war and other things, the United Nations was established, right? So that's one. Uh, notice over here, you know, what things cost. So the, and this, these were in US dollars, right? So you can inflate them a little bit for Singaporean dollars if you'd like. Uh, a house cost about two annual salaries, right? Uh, today it's much more than that. I think more than two annual salaries in that sense. A new car was about $1,000 at that time. 
Yes, a gallon of gasoline about 15 cents. Uh, in terms of technologies, there were only 5,000 televisions in the world. In the world, right? 5,000 televisions in the world. Um, I'll come back to that later. Uh, the microwave oven was, invi was invented. At least the microwave for use in household appliances and these type of things was invented at that time. And the, uh, in some ways, the first programmable co computer, the so-called ENIAC, which as indicated here, took up 1,800 square feet, about 180 square meters of space. You've got in your pocket something that's probably 1,000 times or maybe 10,000 times more powerful than what that computer was, right? So just again, some sense of the technology. Right? The, the most popular Christmas gift, these are little tidbits, was something called the Slinky. You know what a Slinky is? Yeah, the little thing that goes, you, know, you put on the stairs, it goes down, down the stairs, right? That's the Slinky, all right? Uh, and then there was another little tidbit that apparently in 1945, an airplane hit the Empire State Building in the US. That was the tall, maybe the tallest building in the world at the time. And some lady got hit in that and somehow got into an elevator and the elevator crashed, she fell down 75 floors through this elevator shaft and lived, and lived, right? So just a little bit of a tidbit. Now, uh, the Wall Street Journal in 1998 said the year 1945 was the worst year in world history because more people died that year, there was more damage done to the world in terms of physical damage to buildings because of the war and all, I think it was because that was the year I was born. That's why I was so bad, right? And I think, you know, they just, they just didn't want to come out and say it, right? right? But it was not a great year. It was not a great year, right, uh, in any sense. So that's that year. Now I'm just going to, uh, again, reflect a little bit, and then we'll get into some personal things. So what's changed since then in terms of a number of things that have changed, right? So one, just the, the global order of the world has changed, right? We've seen the independence of nations. Right after that World War, India, Pakistan, we know about Singapore becoming a Cambodia later. You know, many, uh, many countries became independent countries. We've had two other wars, major, major wars, the Korean War and the Vietnam War after that. Uh, we had this major event in uh, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was a major event in terms of the Cold War after World War II. And then we have, more recently, 9-11, terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, in the world. So the world has changed many ways in terms of its global order. Uh, there's been changes in civil rights, or you might call more broadly human rights. And in the US, there was this big move of civil rights in terms of uh, the civil rights, so-called civil rights movement. We clearly saw that in South Africa in terms of civil rights for minorities and the like, and seen that in other parts of the world. Social mobility is really inc incredible in terms of what's happened. You know, we can talk to each other anywhere, in any place, any time now with our cell phones and other things. We can fly, as I do, monthly between here in Boston and MIT. Inconceivable at that time. I'll come back to that in a little bit a moment. And then some really significant uh, uh, advances in healthcare. Uh, the polio vaccine was uh, one that essentially eradicated this terrible disease. Smallpox was eradicated, many other things. And then finally, in the technology arena, in 1945, we had no uh, jet airplanes as we know today, right? And, uh, so there were no jet airplanes getting around. Of course, we had no computers, except the ENIAC. We had no cell phones. We had no World Wide Web. We had, actually, some of the inventions along the way were things like the Walkman that provided us with personalized music. It's hard for you folks to even ap appreciate that, right? But back then, uh, 1945, we'd come and watch televisions, and the television would be a little screen about this big, and a big, big console like this. Uh, we had one of our, we had one of the few ones, not in 45, but I think early 50s in uh, the time. So things have changed a lot, and I think uh, that what I'm gonna talk a little bit about in terms of my own journey is predicated on many of these changes. I think it's sort of, affected by many of these changes. So this was uh, my, our house when I grew up. Uh, this is uh, not from then, this is now, what it looks like now given Google, right, to look, to look at it. Uh, it was a modest house, uh, certainly by US standards a modest house. Uh, it was three small bedrooms. Uh, I had uh, a brother and a sister when growing up. My brother and I shared a bedroom. 
in, in this house. Later, I moved to the basement. I went in my own room, so I lived in the basement. He lived upstairs in the room, right, in terms of this. So th that was the house, and that was our neighborhood. Uh, these are some pictures of us as in our youth, right? So I'm the bigger one. I'm the older brother. My brother's a year younger than me. So a couple things you'd notice about this. One, look at the old cars in the background, right? I mean, these are really old cars, right? Uh, secondly, in, th in th those days, now this must be probably early 50s, uh, the, uh, dre pe how people dressed was quite different. Men wore these hats, right? Wore these hats all around like this. Uh, this was taken in Easter. Uh, at that time, girls dressed up in their Easter dresses, right? And went out and we went out to these Easter dresses. Uh, so I, in some ways, the top right one, that's me, looks a bit like an old man dressed up right there. Right? <laughs> Here's this young kid dressed up like an old man. Now, a, a little bit of a story here. So from about age 12, no, maybe it's age a little, age 11 to about age 16, uh, I had something called a paper route. Now, what was a paper route? As I delivered newspapers door to door, so if you go back to that our house, all the way down that street were houses on both sides of the street in the whole neighborhood. So I would there'd be pile on, there would be a pile of newspapers left in the front of my driveway. I would then take them in a big sack. And I walked down the st street and delivered them to all these houses and things. And uh, one year, it might have been this year here, uh, I, you know, I made a little bit of money, not a lot of money doing this, uh, but I actually bought the clothes that we wore that year for our family. So I, I can't say that we came from a poor, poor family, but we came from a middle class family that didn't have, I think, lots of resources. And so I bought the clothes at one time. Just again, some sense of how we get grounded in our life in various things. So this is some other pictures. Um, that's me here in the baseball field. I'm actually in the coach's box here. Uh, that's me, my brother, and my sister again. Uh, that's my father and my mother. Notice uh, the women at that time wore things like furs and these type of things, which you know is not as politically correct these days, though some people can wear them. And you don't wear a lot of them in Singapore, that's for sure, right, at that time. This was at my father's graduation from uh, Syracuse University. He was the only member of his family that went to college. Uh, my grandfather had been a laborer and uh, had worked uh, you know, basically uh, digging things in the ground. And my father uh, was, uh, at night, he came back, he had been in, he'd been in the war, World War II. He came back after that to go to college. And at night, he worked in a rail yard loading rail cars. And during the day, he went to school. I actually uh, went and uh, got a degree in mathematics. And he, at the time, had this young family. It's uh, the three of us, the young children that we had. I'll come back to that in a moment. But again, you see some, you know, looks a little different than today, I would say, right? Pardon? Pardon? How old was he when he graduated? Uh, this was. Uh, he was about 30-something, uh, 30 32, something like 30, 32. Yeah, he'd been in the war, right? So he'd gone overseas in the war for several years. So older, yeah, certainly older. Uh, so now let me talk a little bit about where did I take my first steps. As told to me, I don't remember these, my first steps, right? but I'm told the following. So one of the things that my father did, I'll come back and say some other things about him, when he was in the, uh, the service, uh, he learned how to play gin rummy. It's a coward game, you might know, gin rummy, from someone who had been the Florida State champ in gin rummy. And my father had a bit of a photographic memory, and he could remember things, like he'd sort of remember patterns of cars and all, cards and all these type of things. And he became a very good gin rummy player. So when he came back after the war, for the first six months after he came back for the war, he made his living in Syracuse, New York, so city in upstate New York, gambling. Literally gambling, right? He played, he played gin rummy for money, right? And at that time, they had these so-called, what they call pool rooms. So you'd go into the uh, location, and the front of it would be pool tables. Then you'd open the door in the back, and you'd go into the gambling hall, into the back, right? You might you know, see these type of things in movies or something, that type of thing, right? So he did this for six months, until it was a, it's a small town, Syracuse, New York. Uh, he was winning all the time, so nobody would play him. So then he had to get a real job after that. Right? 
but I'm told that I took my first steps in the pool hall, right? So in this gambling casino, apparently someone had an ice cream and I was w with them and I took my first steps. So that's my first steps. So I'm rooted in this, uh, you know, illegal gambling, uh, something or other, right, in terms of my roots. A second uh, story, again, just a, maybe a little bit of a flavor of things we remember uh, in terms of our lives. Um, for, again, we came from, uh, you know, again, middle class, semi, semi humble backgrounds. So for Christmas, we would get a budget. You had so much money that you get to spend. You know, my parents would give us some money. And then we'd go to the stores and we'd say, we want this, this, and this. So they wouldn't just give us the money, but a budget, right? And then the parents would go out and buy the things we wanted to buy for Christmas, for Christmas presents. So one year, my brother and I decided we were going to pool our money. So we had pooled our money. And we bought this hockey game. And it was one of these, it was sort of like football. It was a hockey game with pink, you know, sides on the side and move the hockey things up and down. And Christmas morning, we got the hockey game on the floor down here. And uh, we have a family event. And my uncle comes over, all, all the family, and he steps on the hockey game. <laughs> Ooh, what a sad story, <laughs> what a sad story. Uh, that was it, I mean, it wasn't as though we were getting another one, right? So we had this hockey game with this little crack in it, right? Uh, for <laughs> sort of a sad story, right? Well, I want to share some sad stories with you, sorry. All right, so the second thing is my father was uh, very good at math. Uh, and I think this maybe says a quite a bit about where I ended up and what I ended up doing. So he used to give me, um, we'd sit in the car, you know, we'd be going someplace and sit in the car, and he'd give me math problems to solve or puzzles to solve. So he would teach me things like, uh, if you want to multiply quickly 75 by 75, it's 5,625. You can do it like that. It's a trick. He, he taught me the trick to do this. If you want to multiply uh, 42 by 11, it's 462. Okay. Just like that. You know, another trick, this type of thing. Or if you want to multiply 20, uh, 24 by 26, because you had the trick for how to do 25 by 25, 625, you can multiply 24 by 26, because it's x plus 1 times x minus 1, which is x squared minus 1. So 24 times 26 would be 624, right? So he taught me all these, these tricks, right? And because of that, I think I sort of internalized all this kind of stuff. And now I think, um, uh, when, I, when I think about numbers and all these things, I can't help myself. I do these crazy computations, right, in my head. So I pick up the sport, I read the sports page every morning, and I pick up baseball scores or hockey scores or this type of thing. And it might say on the sport page, uh, well, this uh, person got uh, through passes in a football game, and he completed 21 of 32 passes. And I say, well, what percentage is that? And immediately I'd say to myself, it's about 65%. Now, how would I say that? Well, it's 21 of 32, so I'd immediately say, 20 of 30 is 67 percent, and then after that you go one of two, so it's got to be a little less than 67 to 66. It turns out to be, I think, 66 and a half or something like that, right? So uh, throughout my life now, every time I see numbers, I do these crazy things. I do these approximations in my head, and sometimes it serves well. So when we're doing budgets for SUTD and we're talking to the staff about the budgets, well, I can do a lot of the calculations, you know, some in my head, right, to an approximation. Why? Because I'm bedeviled. I'm bedeviled with these numbers in my head. Uh, I'll come back to this as well, right? So, uh, you know, one picks up certain things in life, these type of things. My, f my father was much better at this. He could even do it much faster than that. So this, who's this? Ooh. <laughs> That's my high school picture. And that's my wife's high school picture. Not too shabby, eh? <laughs> I don't mean me, her, her. <laughs> Not too shabby, right? So that's us, uh, high school. I, I was older than she was, so th these, these are not from exactly the same year, those high school pictures. That's us getting married. Oh, <laughs> nice, huh? I often kidded her that uh, at that time uh, I looked younger than her, right? And she didn't believe it. And uh, she clearly looks younger than I, me now, much younger, right? But uh, that was uh, getting married. 
All right, now this is a picture I want you to stare at. Two of these people in this picture are Paul McCartney and one is me. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you got to figure out which is which. <laughs> All right, which one's me? Yeah, well, the one with the book in his hand, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the only way you can tell, right? It's the only way you can tell, right? Exactly. So, I used to kid, and my friends used to kid, I look like Paul McCartney. And uh, maybe I look like him now, too, because he's a little, you know, shriveled up, right? <laughs> like me. Yeah, we simply looked a little bit like the other. So, that's, uh, but that was me, uh, college days. Now, come back, I have another picture of that later, right? So uh, me, and Paul, me and my dear friend, Paul McCartney, right? We, yeah, my dear friend. If only I could sing like him, right? Yeah. All right, so that was, that was uh, some grounding. Now maybe we'll turn a little bit to high school. And wh what I want to acknowledge here is three of my teachers. So I remember three of my teachers very vividly. Uh, and you're young enough, so you probably remember your teachers, right, not too long ago. So Mr. Pomeri was my teacher in chemistry. Uh, and he was someone who uh, very much encouraged me to go on in education. Uh, I actually ended up doing my undergraduate in chemical engineering, maybe in part because of him and because my father, after he stopped gambling, ended up working for a chemical company, right? And so all his friends were engineers in chemical companies. And it always seemed pretty exciting to me what they were doing, building new chemical plants and solving problems and all these type of things. Mr. Metzger was my math teacher. And... Um, he was also the uh, head of the chess club. And so I played a lot of chess at that time. I was actually captain of the, uh, the chess team. Uh, we, we uh, at that time, in my high school, had never taught calculus before I was a senior in high school, if you can imagine that, right? In terms of you think about your JCs or the Pallies. Uh, and three of us, three of us took the first ever calculus class. Mr. Metzger was our teacher in high school. I'll come back to that a little bit later. There's another follow-on story for that. Uh, and uh, in my senior year, uh, the, we went to a chess tournament, and we went to Philadelphia, from Boston to, Phil no, yeah, from Syracuse, upstate New York, to Philadelphia. That was the first time I was ever on an airplane. I'm sure all of you have been, many of you have been on airplanes many times, right? My son was in an airplane, you know, at age one or two or something like this, right? Uh, but at that time, Going on an airplane was a big, big deal, right? And that was my first time in an airplane, senior in high school. Now, Mrs. Slavin was my English teacher, my English teacher. And she didn't like me very much. <laughs> and she didn't like the fact that I was this techie kid, nerdy kid or whatever. She said, you should take English more seriously. You should study English more serious. Haas, 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 haas. <laughs> study your haas. I'll be Miss Slavin. Study your haas, right? Uh, she was quite wise. I should have spent more attention on my English. It turns out later in life, I think I did, right? So that was Mrs. Slavin. She always was after me, right? Do more of this. All right, so now well, let's pass on to uni. Ah. So when I went to uni, I went to uni, I, um, I was a commuter. So I lived at home and commuted to school. And so it was a ways away. So I had to have a car. So uh, we, I bought a car. This was my first car, Corvair. This has an engine in the rear. Ralph Nader, if you've ever come across that name, became famous. He wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed about this car. <laughs> but this car was not very. But this car was, uh, it was a convertible. It was red. It was nice. Uh, my wife-to-be and I used to go out on it. And sort of the big event every spring was the first day we'd put down the, put down the top. And she'd have on her, uh, her skirt with her knee, knee socks and all. And we'd go out on our joyride in this car, which was always very enjoyable. So now I have to tell you, do you remember your first exam at SUTD? You remember your first exam? Let me tell you about my first exam in college, right? So I'm taking, now remember I told you I took a course in calculus. I took a course in calculus the, uh, my, in my senior year in high school. So I'm taking this course in calculus the first time, and we, uh, we're doing a quiz. So it's very early, maybe one, even only one week into the course. And I do my quiz, and the, there's a graduate student who's teaching the course. He's at this desk, and I bring over to, to uh, the desk and put down my exam, and he immediately writes on it, F, F. 
And I look at him, I said, what? What's this? What's going on? He says, the notebook is open on your desk. <laughs> Indeed, the notebook was open on my desk. I didn't know it, but the notebook was open. Now, I knew all this material. I taught it before. So my first ever exam score in college was an F, an F. Now, it turned out he became my buddy over, I was a good math student. And I did get an A in the course, right, eventually. But my first exam ever was an F. Now, fast forward second semester, second course in calculus, all right? So second course in calculus. Uh, we had an evening midterm. And remember, I was a commuter going back and forth. So we have this e evening midterm, and I, sh I show up that evening with a friend of mine uh, who was also a commuter, and we'd forgotten which room it was in. So we're running around campus, right? Looking for the room, finding the room. We can't find the room, we can't find the room. We finally find it halfway through the exam. And so what do you think the professor said? What did he say? No, he didn't quite say yeah. He said, good luck, you have half the time, right? You're not getting extra time. This is, you know, some lame excuse. You couldn't find the room. So I got a C in that exam. Oh, it's getting better, right? <laughs> Getting better, I got to see. My poor, uh, my poor uh, friend who was not as good a, a math student, he got an F on the exam. Now I did turn out to get an A in that course as well. So that was, you know, it turned out okay. But these are, you know, some early exams. So, you know, if you have problems with some exams, you can persevere, you know, you can get, you can get through them, right? We can, right? So what did I do? I, I don't remember actually a lot about my, uh, about my undergraduate. I was a chemical engineer. Uh, uh, I'll say a little bit about this. Uh, we, but what I do know is we played a lot of bridge, a lot of bridge, right? Uh, and we used to play it. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, actually, there was a church on campus, and we go into the basement of this church, and we play bridge. And we played, we played a lot of gin rummy. Now, remember I told you my father made his living for six months playing gin rummy. So he, I, he taught me gin rummy. And I, you know, I was playing with uh, friends and all there, and I was winning all the time, right? So I was winning all the time. So now I go back to him and I say, okay, Dad, it's time. <laughs> it's time for us to play, right? <laughs> so I go back and, you know, I'm young, I'm brash. You know, I, I think, you know, I'm beating everybody. This is going to be easy, right? He kills me. He just kills me. It's not even close, right? Uh, so this, this is my, uh, it's, that's about all I remember from undergraduate education. <laughs> no, it was a, it was a good time. Uh, I didn't really like chemical engineering. Uh, it was a little, I remember vaguely uh, things like uh, watching bubbles go up a bubble chamber from one of my professors and he was, he was uh, measuring it with a stopwatch and I said, you know, I don't think I want to spend the rest of my life doing that. Now, he enjoyed it, right, but it just wasn't me. So I, I uh, actually, when I was a senior, that same professor uh, gave me a, a senior project, a, a special reading book, and it was in the field of optimization, which I then became to love and I... I Pursue that, and I'll say more about that in a moment. So that's the undergraduate stories. Now, the journey to graduate school. So here we were in um, Syracuse, New York, upstate New York, if you can imagine the US. And I went to graduate school at Stanford, so on the other side of the country. So one, just the journey was you know, me and my young bride, right, going off to the other side of the world, going there. But I, I was told this story. I had very good grades as an undergraduate. I think. Uh, maybe 2,000 graduates that year at uh, Syracuse University, and I might have had, had the third highest GPA or something like that. Now, it turns out it was not too bad, not, not too bad. <laughs> I was a pretty good student. But, but, but uh, there's always a clinker to these stories. I was in a, a, my graduating class was in chemical engineering, which was very small, 12 students. And who was the valedictorian of that? One of the 12 students, right? So I wasn't even the top student in my group of 12, right? So he was, this is Victor Klee. He was ended up, I don't know actually where Victor ended up, but he was the best student at the university, right? Uh, and uh, so I applied to Stanford, and the department I was going to was the Department of Operations Research, uh, which at that time was very mathematical. And most of, the, most of the students who went there had come from math departments from around the world. And they didn't know, uh, uh, Syracuse University very well, right? And they certainly didn't know my department very well. And so I, I'm told this story later that one of the faculty members, who I'll mention to you in a moment, uh, they were in the admissions meeting and they weren't going to admit me, right? Because I came from this 
it wasn't coming from the math department, it was coming from CAMI, and I was coming from a school that wasn't on, typically on the radar screen in terms of admissions. And it made, I think, it, as I was told, he said, let's give the kid a chance, right? You know, he's got good grades, maybe he'll work out, let's give him a chance. So that's how I got to Stanford, right? Because of this professor said, let's give the kid a chance. And I must say, when I went there, as I said, it was a very mathematical uh, department. Uh, and I had come from a, I had taken some math as an undergraduate, but I would say not a lot in some ways. But boy, I was learning every day. You know, when I first started, all the other students, or many of them had come from math backgrounds, they'd actually had some version of these math courses before me. Uh, but I was, I was behind them when we started, but I was learning more than them every day. And this was very exciting to me. I mean, I was just soaking this up, learning this stuff. Now, my wife tells a different story. This is bridge poker tennis, right? So bridge poker tennis. So again, we played a lot of bridge, right? And uh, I'll come back to the bridge in a moment. Uh, we played a lot of poker, and uh, we played a lot of poker. Some of it was for money, and we used to play all night poker, right? So we play all night. And I, you know, as I was preparing for this talk, I was saying, my wife let me go off and play all those all night poker games? I guess at that time, you know, she must have been pretty understanding, right? Young wife. Uh, I don't know, but we did it. We played poker. And, but the story she used to tell was the following. She was working at the time. I was going to graduate school. She was working. And the story she would tell is, uh, like, maybe like many of you, uh, I would tend to do my work late at night. So I would tend to do it till maybe 2 in the morning, something like that, doing my work. And then I'd like to sleep late in the morning, right? So I would sleep maybe till 9, 10 if I didn't have a class, right? Something like that, right? So she would go to work, and uh, then she would come home at lunchtime, driving, we had one car, she'd come home with one car, and then she would drive me to the university, and then, this is not the story as she tells it, right? No, it's the story as she tells it. And then she would drive back to work, and then I'd spend the afternoon at the university, and then uh, I, she'd come back and pick me up. And then she'd say, say when she, this is the thing, her version of the story is, Whenever she did that, I, when I'd come home, I'd say, well, I have to really rest before I can get to my homework because I've been playing tennis all afternoon. <laughs> so her version of, of life at that time where she was working, I was doing homework late at night, playing tennis all day long. Quite a nice life, right, if you can get it, right? Quite a nice life if you can get it. Uh, so that was that. Now, the, uh, the bridge was, you know, I'd, be, I'd been an okay bridge player, I think, but one of my friends was a very good bridge player, another, another graduate student. And he had uh, played in some uh, national tournaments and these type of things had done quite well. So he said one night, uh, you, know, you know, we just played these pickup games and things, sometimes for money, but pickup games. He said, I'll, I'll take you to the, uh, one of the bridge clubs. So these is where the better players got together. So we sat down at this uh, bridge club table and, um, you know, he's talking to all his friends and all these kind of things. And we start playing bridge. And about the third hand in, uh, I get the bed, so I'm playing the cards, and his hand's the dummy. So he's looking all around the room and all this kind of stuff. And then the hand ends, and he said, well, how many did you make? And how many uh, did you make in this? And I said, well, I made three. He says, well, you clearly should have made four. I said, what do you mean I should have made four? So well, it was clear the guy to the left had this card, the card, the guy to the right had this card. He had this, he had that. So he was explaining to me, just based upon the bidding, what everybody had. And I must say, from that moment out, the rest of the night was a complete blur to me, right? I said, you know, I can't, I can't compete in, this, in these go-rounds with these type of people. Now, I should also say the same thing about baseball. So what I really wanted to be was a Major League Baseball player. This is what I wanted to be in my life, a Major League Baseball player. And there was this tradition, I'll get back to this later in the talk, to this. Uh, and I was an okay player. I played through high school. Uh, again, maybe instead when I should have been studying these type of things. But at some point as I was growing up, the kids got to be faster, stronger, and more athletic. So I never made it to this to high school. So I'm a professor and I'm before you now because I didn't make it as a baseball player. I think if I had a choice, I think I would have tilted the other way, right? In terms of being a baseball player. So I'll come back to that when I start talking about my many failures. All right, so that's a bit of that. All right, so this is us now, right? So this is... Uh, I, you know, I went through these periods of diff different grooming, right? <laughs> right? So th this is what I had my little goatee. Now, I could never grow a beard, so I didn't have enough, mu I didn't have enough hair on the side, but I could grow this goatee. Uh, and that was our, uh, our apartment. 
again, that's my wife. Notice behind us is a painting there. That's a Van Gogh's painting called The Potato Eaters. And The Potato Eaters, it's one of his very famous paintings about these peasants living and eating potatoes. And I think we put it on our wall. Some of us needed to cover the wall. We like Van Gogh, but also to remind us we were peasants, right? We were, pe we were graduate students. We didn't have any money, right? We were these peasants living out there. Uh, that was a, a grand time for us. All right, this is... Uh, Students have to sleep, you know, students have to sleep. So this is <laughs> me as a graduate student, uh, I'm the one on the left. <laughs> I'm the one on the left. That's my newborn son, right? And uh, this is, uh, you know, my wife thought it would be just sort of funny that if he grew a mustache. So he grew a mustache for this picture, right? <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, doing this. Uh, so that's us and Grant. So you see that my... Uh, I'll come, I'll come back to the hair in a moment, right? But the hair went through uh, facial hair and hair on top went through various uh, mo modes. All right, so let me uh, just talk now about three happy moments, really happy moments. So if you reflect on your life, you say, are there particular happy moments you've had now or will there be in the future? And here's the three happy moments. And one is a bit of a sad moment, I'll sort of tell you. It's a sort of a happy and sad moment. So the first one was when we got married. I mean, this was in the... Uh, a incredible uh, for me, uh, you know, marrying the woman I loved, etc. We've been married now for 49 years. Next year makes 50. That's quite something huh, in terms of this. So that was a happy moment. The second happy moment, which is a little different, I grew up this amazing baseball plan, uh, uh, fan, and my home team was something called the Boston Red Sox. Right? So uh, the Boston Red Sox, or some of you may have heard of them if you've been to MIT or know the area. And uh, they went for 86 years without winning the world championship, 86 years. Now, for those who have been, if you have an interest in uh, baseball, uh, the Chicago Cubs now, just for 108 years, finally won the World Series right this year, but for 86 years. So in 2004, they won the World Series. And my son and my wife and I are sitting at the uh, kitchen table, and uh, when they win the, th the thing, you know, we hug and we kiss and we start celebrating. And all of a sudden, my wife is gone. Where'd she go? She's gone for a long time, gone a long time. So finally, she comes back, and she presents me with a crystal baseball, right, a crystal baseball that she had been saving for years until the Red Sox <laughs> won the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> won the World Series. But it had been so long, she couldn't find it. <laughs> so that's why she was gone so long. And then after that, uh, my father by this time had passed away. And he was in New Jersey. So sometime later, we took a trip to New Jersey. And we went to his grave with a Red Sox pin, because he's been this enormous Red Sox fan. So we're going to uh, uh, dig a hole and put it in this, uh, by his grave in terms of this. And uh, with the ground was hard, so we had some trouble doing this. So we saw, uh, so we saw one of the groundskeepers come along. And uh, he, we said, um, you know, we'd like to bend, uh, bury this. And maybe you could help us. He said, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You mean we can't bury things near the grave? He said, no, no, this is Yankee territory. You can't put a Red Sox <laughs> <laughs> well, Then he finally let us put one in. So we did, we did put one in. We did put one. So that was happy moment number two. Uh, happy moment number three was the following. Uh, you saw a picture of my son. So up till age two, he was completely normal. But at age two, he had strokes some rather considerable strokes. And he's uh, multiply handicapped, right? He has cerebral palsy, multiply handicapped. But after he had these uh, first strokes, we brought him, I'm not gonna do too much tear jerking here, all right? I, I'll come back to this at the end. But after he had the first stroke, uh, he was in the hospital, and he was at bedridden, and he, you know, he couldn't move around. But we were there one day to visit him, and all of a sudden, after the stroke, he comes walking down the hall, walking down the hall, right? And I must say, that is the, the happiest moment of my life. Now, it turns out that was short-lived. He had a stroke again after that and lost his mobility, his wheelchair-bound, this type of thing. But that's, what, you know, sometimes you have these moments in life where something happens and it just hits you in such a way, emotionally, psychologically, whatever. Uh, and it just was, uh, again, I, I can see it to this day, him walking down in this really exciting moment, right, that, uh, you know, my son's okay. My son's okay. It's a happy moment, right? 
and also a sad moment in the sense of what happened after. So those are happy moments. Okay, here's three gentlemen. These three gentlemen were my thesis advisors for my PhD. Uh, the one at the top left, a fellow named George Danzig, is uh, widely viewed as the father of my field, my field of optimization, constrained optimization, linear programming, National Medal of Science winner. So some people view him as one of the great mathematicians of the last century. Right. The middle person is a fellow named Donald Knuth. Donald Knuth is known as one of the greatest computer scientists ever. Uh, he's written a four-volume series on computer science. I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, he also, you might know him for another reason, he's the author of Latex. So you all use Latex? Just as a sidelight, you know, he thought that uh, fonts weren't very pretty, technical uh, uh, interactions with uh, technology wasn't very good, so he developed something called Latex. He also designed organs for his church. He was one of these people that just did everything. Uh, one of my, I, I hardly knew him, but he was gracious enough to be on my thesis committee. I have two, two remembrances for that. One is uh, I was doing a fairly mathematical, theoretical thesis, and um, uh, he at that time was writing one of his books, and I would uh, quote a result from the, the literature, uh, something uh, that uh, was pretty deep and a pretty, uh, a pretty remarkable result, and he would go to the back of the page and rederive re the result from scratch. I mean, this guy was really, really smart, <laughs> really, really smart. Second thing for him is that uh, I, for some reason, when I submitted my PhD thesis, uh, I wanted it to be the shortest thesis in the history of the department. I thought this was some badge of courage or something, right? So I wrote this thesis, uh, which, and it was mathy, but it had almost no words. <laughs> so it was theorem proof, theorem proof, theorem proof, theorem proof. It had a few words, but not many in between. And so I leave it for him to, to look at, and he writes me back this scathing letter. This is the worst technical exposition I've ever seen in my life, right? You, know, you, know, you should you know, write it in a way that we can follow it. And uh, it was, of course, very good advice, the very right advice. Uh, but that was my advice from this notable uh, computer scientist. And that's Curtis Eves, who was in our, the department as well. Uh, Curtis was also a very top-notch scholar. Uh, one of the things about him is he rode his motorcycle to bike every year, uh, to, to, to school every day. So this is what I do. Right, so uh, my, uh, uh, those, uh, any of you who are in ESD or taking optimizations, you're all right, all right, so you've taught a little bit about optimization. So what I, what I tend to do and what I come, came to, lo to love, actually, was optimization, right? So taking a problem, you have a set of constraints, you have an objective function. This is a picture of a polyhedron and a method for going around that. And this method is actually the one that my thesis advisor developed, so something called the simplex method. Now I'm going to, since I'm giving my last lecture, I got to teach something, right? So I got to teach them. <laughs> so I'm going to teach something to you, right? So come, come, come with me. All right. So, oh, so I want you to think. I want you to think of the following. We have a rope. We have two uh, blue marks on the rope. So think of these as two places in a city network. Think of each of the knots in this as being an intersection in the city network. And think of the ropes between them as being the streets, the length of the streets. And now suppose we want to find the shortest path between these two blue dots, the blue endpoints, right? We want to find the shortest path, right? And these shortest path problems arise all the time. Every time you pick up your telephone, it's getting running through a network, you're finding shortest paths. If you look at your GPS, it's finding shortest paths, et cetera, et cetera. It rises all the time. So while we're going to do the following, you're going to hold that one. I'm going to hold this. You can unwind some of these. All right, now if you look at the path that we have now, so we have a path where the, where the rope is tight, right? We have a path. And that's the shortest path between those two points. You agree with me? You do? You do. All right, because we've just done something very, very strange. Very strange which should really puzzle you. To find the shortest path, we've taken this rope and we've pulled it as far apart as possible. That is, we've maximized, not minimized. You want to minimize. And yet we found the shortest path. Hey, hey, hey something's wrong. 
or something's magical, something's magical. Okay, thank you, all right? This is called duality in optimization. So in optimization, often in optimization, if you have a problem, all right, there's an associate, if you have a problem that's minimizing something, minimizing the cost, minimizing the travel distance, minimizing uh, uh, human resources, any resources, often there's an associated maximization problem, an op a, a different problem, which is equivalent to it in the sense if you solve the maximization problem, you solve the minimization problem as well. And it's uh, sometimes easier to solve one problem than the other, so by having this tool to you, you can solve a variety of problems. Now, I like it for that reason, but I also like it because it's mathematically beautiful. And this is really mathematically beautiful, right? Uh, it just, it, uh, I, I just find it uh, um, um, very uh, uh, engaging. Uh, so there's another famous mathematician, von, John von Neumann, you might know him or heard of, John von Neumann. He developed this theory of so-called duality for some of these optimization problems. Um, so, let me go back to this. So now you know a little bit about there's something called duality and optimization, right? Uh, if I had more time, if I were really giving the last lecture, I'd dig into this. I'd teach you all about it. You'd love it, right, because it's so wonderful. And <laughs> you'd love optimization because it's so wonderful. Yes, 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 there we go. <laughs> Our faculty. Why? Because optimization is everywhere, right? So uh, optimization, if you think about physical systems, uh, if you think about mixing gases in a, in a, a physical, in a chemical system, that's equivalent to minimizing the so-called Gibbs-free energy. If you think about uh, loading an electrical circuit with uh, some power and you want to find out what the flow is in the electrical circuit, that's equivalent to minimizing the heat loss or heat dissipation in the network. If you want to look at something called spatially separated economic markets and you want to find out why we distribute goods from one location to another, that's equivalent to an optimization problem which is called minimizing or maximizing consumer surplus or, or um, you know, consumer surplus. Optimization arises in statistics. Whenever we do regression, we're doing optimization, right? It arises in all kinds of theory. It arises in telecommunication systems. It arises in uh, uh, supply chain systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I love it. I love it. So I found something I loved. Right? I loved uh, this field of optimization, and it's sort of driven much of my professional life. And I also love it being a professor. Now, this is not me as a professor. Uh, th you're going to see the hair coming back here, right? right? So this is that picture I saw you before. So this is me as an undergraduate studying. It's actually in my, my uh, in-law's home. I have a chair there. And my wife said that there's a, a can right there is a, actually a big can of potato chips <laughs> for whatever reason. And that's me uh, the last year as a graduate student, right? So this is sitting on our patio in uh, Palo Alto, California. And notice the flowing black hair. Uh -huh. I'm trying to emulate my wife from that picture you saw, right, with that flowing, <laughs> that flowing hair. Right? You'll notice this corduroy jacket. You'll notice this uh, orange shirt. So at those times, we wore these really colorful shirts and these type of things. Uh, I'll tell you one story. Uh, I had to go back home, and I looked like this going back home. And when I went, I looked. I didn't have any mustache. I didn't have any long hair or anything. So you know, people would think, hey, this guy's a hippie, right? So when I was going home, I said, what are my parents going to think of me when I go home, right? So we go home for uh, Christmas holidays, and my wife, and we arrive at the airport. Parents come to pick us up, and my father then has a mustache like mine, and he's wearing purple velvet pants, <laughs> purple velvet pants. <laughs> at that point, I said, I'm okay. You know, it's okay. <laughs> purple velvet pants. Bell bottoms, bell bottoms, oh, and bell bottoms as well. So those are the type of things we wore. You know, this was the 70s, right? These are the type of things people wore in the 70s. So that was me there. All right, this is a picture of me with that uh, uh, George Danzig that I mentioned, uh, the father of optimization. That was taken at his home. That, in some ways, is my most precious professional photograph. Right? Uh, that uh, he was a great man, um, and uh, my uh, thesis advisor. Often we develop these very close relationships with our thesis advisors and you're working as a PhD student. And then sometime, some years later, 
you can see my hair color has changed. I was giving him an award. He's not giving me an award. I'm giving him an award. I had the uh, opportunity of, of giving him an award. He's won many, many, many awards from all over the place. So this is another event. So this is an event. So when uh, George Danzig, Professor Danzig, turned 70 years old, they had a party for him, and I represented his uh, former students. I was the one representative of his former students, and there were a couple of Nobel laureates who spoke and these type of things. And I sort of, my, my uh, talk at that time was a day in the life of one of George Danzig's students. And I just sort of rattled through the day, and it sort of helped was a clever way. The guy in the middle, Pete V. Not, he's the one that said, give the kid a chance. Give the kid a chance. So, uh, so this, was a, and I, this was a party for the three of them. Uh, Danzig's 90th birthday, the other two's 70th birthday. And I was the MC at that party. So I was the master of ceremonies for that evening. And uh, my theme for that night was things that come in threes. And I had a list of about 50 things that came in threes. Three blind mice, that, 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 all, you know, all these little funny things. And the guy at the right was someone who I've come pretty close to. I'll just tell you one story about him. He was an optimization guy as well, faculty member. Uh, so uh, when I was just finishing my PhD, I think my last semester, I walk into the uh, school, university, and he's down at the other end of the hallway. So I yell to him down the other end of the hallway, hello, professor, hello, professor. He calls me into his office. He sits down at his desk. He sits me down at this desk. He says, young man, do you know what a professor is? He says, yeah, I think I know what a professor is. He says, a professor is a piano player at a whorehouse. <laughs> it's a piano player at a whorehouse. It's the time that they call professors. So now I'm thinking, now I leave, I don't know. So I'm thinking, now what do I make of this? One, I've offended him by calling him professor. Or second, this was his way of telling me I can now call him Dick instead of professor. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so now, from that moment on, every time I'd see him in the hallway, <laughs> I didn't know what to call him. <laughs> All right. So that's, uh, that's these three uh, great, uh, unfortunately, the first two have passed away. Dick is still, I, I, I can call him Dick now. I don't call him Professor. I call him Dick now. That's my, that's my Dick Cottle story. Right. Okay. So now we turn to life as a professor. How much time do we have left? Okay, all right, all right. So now life as a professor. All right, so look at this. That's me as a professor, as a professor. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I've always been fond of this picture because I think professors shouldn't look like this, right? Uh, but I, I, I couldn't find this one. So in, uh, in preparation for this talk, I had people from MIT scurrying all around to try to find this in some of the archives, and they were able to find it, right? So this is me with my long, flowing black hair, right? Look at that black hair. I think it's the same jacket that was in the, on the because uh, I probably only owned one jacket at that time, that was in that previous picture. All right, there's me teaching and me teaching, right? So this is the typical, I mean, I love to teach. I mean, I think teaching is uh, something that, uh, Trying to, and what I like to do is, when I teach, try to explain things in as simple a way as possible and get the, the uh, sort of a core of an idea across. And for me, just the challenge of trying to think about that and trying to articulate that as I teach, and then really trying to engage the students. Try to really engage them and have them work with me and get excited with me, develop this passion with me in terms of things we're doing. So that's sort of me waving my hands around trying to get the students. Uh, I did have dark hair at one time. See, this is proof. These are not Photoshop. These are not Photoshop. <laughs> These are real pictures. Real pictures. All right. This is a list of my PhD students. And one of the most enjoyable things about being a professor clearly is working with students like yourselves, but also this close relationship that you have with your PhD students. So there's about, uh, what, I think about 30 of them here. Uh, you'll notice that the first one was 1975, uh, and the last one is 2016. So one just graduated just this year. Uh, he may be my last PhD student, I don't know. If this is my last lecture, maybe it should be my last student, I don't know. <laughs> one of the things about this group is, I think I was counting yesterday, I think seven of them went off, one is a dean now at a, a, a business school in the US, 
and I think six others have been associate deans at various universities. So maybe this administrative stuff that I do rubbed off on them in some ways, right? And they've got this terrible disease, you know, they go to the dark side going from being a professor to university administration. But I'm very proud of them, they're, they're dear friends, uh, and uh, it's always a pleasure to interact with them. All right, so this is another picture I'm really fond of of me because it's got numbers in the back, right? I tell you all about numbers. And these are two books that uh, I've co-authored. Uh, the first one was, I think some of you may be using, maybe actually some of you might be using both, I don't know, but uh, co-authored two books. Uh, the one in the middle in particular I think has done particularly well. Now, smart people. When I first got to MIT as a professor, I had uh, done this thesis basically on my own because my thesis advisor, George Zanzig, uh, this great figure, uh, wasn't particularly knowledgeable, interested in what I was doing. I was doing some crazy mathematics at the time. But I had this problem I had been working on, and uh, uh, I couldn't solve it, and it possessed me. This problem possessed me. And I would, uh, you know, get up at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, you know, this sort of this typical thing you think about with, you know, these uh, people doing things. I, I'd say, I got the answer, and I'd write something down, and then, Three hours later, I wake up, and it was gibberish, of course, right, in terms of this. So I just, I couldn't knock this problem off, right? It was really, uh, really possessed by it. So I get to MIT, and there's a, a fellow in the math department who uh, was, was a full professor who had done some work in a related area. So I posed this problem to him. And uh, people uh, sort of referred to this guy as having a God-given talent for mathematics. He was just a brilliant, brilliant mathematician. And uh, he was able to solve much of my problem in a few days. So he just came, and then I was able to finish it off in terms of this. So we wrote a couple of papers together, right? Uh, now at this point, you know, you just jo just joined a university. You've met somebody at this university. You're a professor, right? You, know, you think you've done well as a student, all this kind of stuff. And you meet this guy, and it's crystal clear he's a lot smarter than I am. He's a lot smarter than I am. Now there's two things you can do at this point. One, you can get depressed, right, and say, my God, I know, I, I, that's terrible, I'm going to this environment. Or you can say, my, oh my, aren't I so fortunate to be in an environment with all, with these, all these smart people that can help me do what I want to do, right, in the right way. <laughs> right? It's true, right? Help me do, or just I can be around them, all these really smart people. Uh, so, uh, here's one, a smart people, a smart, pe a smart people. Hey, we have a smart people here. Good, good, good. He is, I see. He is, he is. Oh, it's good, good to have smart people around you. So I, fortunately, I took the latter approach. I must say, when I taught my first class at uh, MIT, I go into the classroom, and I figure, I'm going to be sitting here trying to teach all these geniuses, you know, all these math. MIT students are all geniuses. Well, it turns out they were pretty smart, but I think I was probably about as smart as they were. So <laughs> it, it was okay. It was okay. And not that I was smarter, but maybe about as smart as they were. So that was one. Another example of this is, uh, this was much, much later. Uh, there was a, uh, you know, we have, the, when you have a, a PhD student, you have PhD committees, and the committee meets to uh, go over the, uh, the student's work as their thesis, and you either approve the thesis or not. So uh, I was on this particular committee, and uh, there was three of us on the thesis committee, myself, two other faculty, and the students. And I'm sitting here in the middle of this uh, meeting, uh, you know, engaging, participating. And it strikes me, there's four people in this room, and I'm the fourth smartest. I'm the fourth smartest. And it's really true. I mean, these were three really, really smart people. And again, I felt really good about it, right? I got all these really smart colleagues around me. Uh, they may be smarter than me in some ways, but maybe I have other talents that are different than theirs and I can use, right, and this kind of stuff. So it's nice to be around smart people. So as you have your smart colleagues, you know, <coughs> rejoice in them. You have other talents, maybe, right? And probably, I mean, you're all here because you're smart. That's why we admitted you, right? But some people are a little smarter than others, and I ran into some really, really smart people at MIT. Okay, now maybe some words about administration. So these are, uh, I'm not going to go through this whole chart in great detail, but these are some things that I've been involved with in administration at MIT. So one is the Operations Research Center is a center that uh, was, the, that's where all these PhD students came from, the center I co-directed that for some time. The management science area is about a third of the Sloan School of Management. I was ahead of that for several years. Uh, this thing called MIT LGO, uh, we, we started a program 
in the 80s called Leaders for Manufacturing. In the 80s, uh, the U.S. Uh, had a terrible crisis of manufacturing. They were getting out, out, the economy was not doing well, manufacturing wasn't doing well, and the Japanese in particular were beating the U.S. terribly in terms of manufacturing. And MIT decided to establish a program that would create a new generation of leaders to go out into the, uh, in a master's level program and research program. And I was fortunate enough to be a co-director of that as a faculty member in the Sloan School. So I was the Sloan School co-director. There was a School of Engineering co-director. I'm very proud of that program. I think if you go to almost any of the major manufacturers in the U.S. and you went to the VP of Manufacturing, he'll know that program. He'll know graduates of that student. He's probably hired them, or he might have been a graduate of himself. It's uh, some 25 years old now. Uh, MIT SDM has a program called System Design and Management that we started. Uh, this was MIT's first ever uh, distance education program where we were teaching uh, it was uh, both on campus and off campus and we were broadcasting at that time to 12 different sites. So we had students at 12 different sites and I was teaching optimization to students at these 12 different sites. Uh, the next two programs were two large programs that we had, one with Microsoft and one with HP. They were both five-year, $25 million programs. Uh, the Microsoft one was to uh, innovate in terms of education and develop a variety of things. And the HP one was to look at wireless communications and a variety of other things. Uh, UPOP, you know, uh, I'm uh, really proud that I started the program called UPOP at MIT. Uh, before I was dean, I had this idea for this. MIT had this longstanding program called UROP, which is, again, I think we all know about undergraduate research opportunities program. I thought it would be a good program to have a parallel program called UPOP. But I couldn't get that really anybody's attention for it. But then I became dean. I said, I can do it. I'm the dean. <laughs> I'm the dean. I'm the dean. I can do it. I'm the dean. So we did it. So we did it, right? Uh, and my, uh, my uh, associate dean, well, I'll show you a picture of him later. Dick Yu took charge of it and did a great job with it. ISN is an institute for soldier nanotechnology, which was a very large-scale program with the Army. Uh, and uh, I, again, I was dean, and I helped to get that going, provided some resources for them. The MIT Leadership Engineering Program, Gordon Program, uh, it was a, a very, one of the, probably the most famous and accomplished engineers in the world is a fellow named Bernie Gordon. He's developed uh, some of the uh, uh, first uh, x-ray machines and these type of things. Um, and he, he's an MIT alum. He's been very generous as a philanthropist. I worked on him for two and a half years to give a major grant to MIT to establish a program like this. And he wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. And the, um, my last Friday as Dean of Engineering, he gave us $25 million to start this program. So that was that program. Now I have to say a little bit more about that. Uh, uh, I didn't transition till Dean until Sunday night. Now why Sunday night, right? Well, the following Tuesday, the senior administration was holding a retreat of all the deans and VPs. And the new dean wanted to attend that, so we had to be dean on Tuesday. And that, I think it was that Sunday, I was throwing out the first pitch at the Red Sox game, something I always do all my life, my aspirations. And I wanted to do it as dean of engineering. I thought it would be cool to have the MIT dean of engineering throw out the first pitch. So we negotiated that I could stay on as dean for two more days <laughs> until that evening so I could throw out the first pitch and then the other guy could take over. Uh, I'll, I'll come back on the first pitch in, in the next slide, actually. Uh, MIT Mechanical Engineering, uh, one of the things that we did when I was dean is we combined two departments at MIT. We merged ocean engineering and mechanical engineering, and you folks are too young to appreciate university politics, but you just don't do things like this at universities. Uh, I sometimes refer to this as a dean hanging offense, a dean hanging offense. And that, we worked two years on that, right, in terms of providing the right incentives for people to do it. I think it's been a great success. It's actually helped out the ocean engineering folks. Uh, the one next to it is really quite interesting. So we were, um, we had established a unit in the School of Engineering called Biological Engineering. And we had a Department of Chemical Engineering. And the chemical engineering people wanted to give a degree, undergraduate degree, called Chemical and Biological Engineering. And their view was, they were the pioneers of biological engineering at MIT. Uh, they actually, the, the heads of the affiliated program all were chemists previously. And the people who were heading the new program in biological engineering says, 
that's our name. You can't use it. You can't use it. And, uh, they, and there, then there was all these arguments about and. So they said chemical and biological engineering. Did and mean union or intersection? <laughs> if and meant union, then you were taking our turf, right, because you had biological engineering. And the chemies would say, well, if it's intersection, it's too narrow. So this went on for, I think, about a year and a half. And I had faculty from both sides into my office yelling at me and <laughs> complaining about the other ones. I went back and forth, and I'm trying to resolve this, trying to solve it. And then finally I said, look at guys. Look at guys and gals. We're going to use a hyphen. <laughs> <laughs> so I negotiated for almost two years for a hyphen, for a hyphen. <laughs> And they finally said, I think reluctantly, they finally said yes. They finally said yes. So this is sometimes what we university administrators do, right? That's sometimes what we do. It's very important. Hyphens are very important, right? <laughs> remember that. Remember, remember Mrs. Slavin in English? Hyphens are very important. Okay. Uh, women in engineering, we, uh, when I uh, took over as dean, uh, we uh, did not have a lot of women faculty in the School of Engineering. Our largest department, uh, one of our largest departments at that time was mechanical engineering. It had, I think, 52 faculty, one woman faculty member, right? Now, it wasn't as one as though uh, MIT was distinctive in that sense. Many of the mechanical engineering uh, programs in the country were like that. And another one of our large departments uh, uh, had uh, very few women. Uh, so we created, a, uh, bef just as I was becoming uh, dean, MIT issued a very, quite a famous report called the Women in Science Report, which got national, international news about uh, uh, issues of women in science, faculty members in science. And MIT did a mea culpa, said, you know, that uh, we were responsible for part of this, we got to do something about it, and created some programs. So we did a similar report in the School of Engineering, and we then uh, worked with our women faculty members. And I'm really proud to say that we doubled the percentage of women in about 10 years went from about 10% to 20% of the School of Engineering's faculty. So I'm quite proud of that. And then the last one is Open Courseware. You, you probably, many of you know Open Courseware. It's the repository of all the MIT courses. Uh, I wanted to create a version of that for high schools. And so we did create something called Open Courseware Highlights for High School. And what we did is we went to the uh, advanced credit uh, curricula for advanced placements uh, for high schools. And we took the various subject matter for that, mapped that onto the MIT curriculum, and then pr pr provided some resources for, for teachers and students. And at one time, I think uh, there were maybe 50,000 students or teachers a year who were going to the website and using it. So it, it uh, I think, had some success. So this was you know, some things that I was involved with, uh, I think we had some successes with. Now I'm going to turn to a page of failures, right? So it's about as long as the successes, right? So I'll talk about these. So one of the first one is this first pitch in baseball. So this was uh, um, one of the crowning moments of my life, right? I'd always wanted to be this baseball player. I always wanted to be in the Boston Red Sox. I'd finally gotten to uh, give this first pitch. And I don't know if you know, but they have these ceremonials first pitch. You go out in, out in the ballpark, right? You stand on, the, you stand on the, uh, the pitching mound, you throw the ball. So I, um, I, I invite my whole family in. They're all the Red Sox. They come from all over the country. They come for this thing. We have a gala event the night before. Uh, I'm, I'm so, I was practicing my pitching and stuff. I haven't pitched in decades and this kind of thing. So we get out there, and one of my friends at MIT, unbeknownst to me, he was the head of the video department at MIT. He, he made a video of me doing this. Actually, he made a, a nice video, which I'll, I'll tell you why it's a nice video. So I get out there, and I get out on the mound, and uh, all of a sudden I get in this mound, and home plate looks like it's about three miles away. I said, oh my God, that's a long way away, right? So I, and that now they had asked me before for a little bio sketch, you know, a little bio something. And I thought this was just for the, them to have. All of a sudden, they start giving, like the bio sketch that you gave, they start giving this bio sketch of me over the loudspeaker system. And I'm pretty embarrassed, right? They're talking about this guy's academic credentials. I don't want to, I'm a baseball fan. I want to, <laughs> I'm sort of embarrassed. So I'm getting all nervous. I throw the ball, boom, it bounces, it bounces. It goes to home plate, <laughs> bounces twice, right? So this was, again, simultaneously one of the best moments of my life and one of the worst moments of my life. You know, I wanted to be this baseball player, right? But the, my friend on this film just sort of captured me going to throw it 
he didn't capture the bounces. And there was actually a film, I think you can probably find it on some MIT website. So that was one of my failures. Second failure was uh, when we were doing the system design and management program at a distance, we brought the first video conferencing system ever to uh, MIT. Uh, it's called PictureTel. Uh, it's, uh, Norm God, who was an MIT alum, it's founded this company. And we had it in place, and it became, uh, it was you know, a new technology, first time technology. We used it for a while, but it was very clear that it was, uh, needed a lot of help. We needed staff for it, it was gonna be very expensive. So eventually we just gave it away to somebody else on campus. So I say that was a failure, right? We tried to, tried to use this technology and couldn't use it. I mentioned this uh, Leaders for Global uh, op Operations, LFM, which I was very proud of. We had a research program as well as the educational program for that. The educational program has been an enormous success. The research program never took hold. And I think in part, we, you know, the companies that were working with us at that time were the big three auto companies, so it was GM and Chrysler and Ford, it was Boeing Corporation, Intel, Motorola, these signature companies, uh, digital equipment. And in some ways, uh, they had their own research activities, their own research units. So any piece of research that we did was maybe duplicating things they were already doing in some ways. So the program never took, never took hold, unfortunately. Uh, I mentioned open courseware for high schools. I really wanted to establish an, a, a national initiative and have uh, open courseware available for all the high schools uh, in uh, uh, the US. Uh, I wanted it to be a, a national initiative working with companies. Uh, I wanted to have an annual uh, teachers event at MIT and all these types of things. And I never got quite enough resources to make it happen, right? I think maybe I didn't put enough effort into it uh, in that way. So again, it was a failure, something I really wanted to do, didn't, didn't work out. Uh, School of Engineering Restructuring. When I was dean, uh, I thought, as I think now, that the structure of our engineering schools wasn't quite right, and maybe there should be a new way of structuring it. Uh, and in particular, I didn't think we could uh, eliminate all the departments at MIT, but thought that perhaps we could create a common sophomore year that maybe had uh, th three or four uh, different areas. So one could be in sort of uh, physics-based uh, material, one could be a molecular-based material, sort of chemistry, biology. One could be in systems, et cetera. Uh, and I could never sell it at MIT. It does have some resemblance to SUTD, so we come back to that. We come back to that. <laughs> That's it. Again, when you're dean, you can do stuff. When you're president, you can do some stuff, too. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, uh, engineering and energy. When I, again, when I was dean, I thought that um, you know, one of the world's great and most pressing problems was energy. And I said, why don't we take the world's best thinking in engineering, hopefully that would be MIT, the best thinking of, en of uh, engineering, and bring it to bear upon the world's energy problems. And our provost at that time, Bob Brown, a dear friend who's also an engineer, said, Tom, not so fast. So the energy problem is not just a school of engineering problem or issue, it's a broader problem. So he sort of helped me back. We had a series of uh, evening meetings with others from a campus, he actually some people from Harvard as well, and we really never did it. Now in this case, when the next president came, Susan Hockfield, she took this as, as one of her important initiatives, and she did develop a, a rather large and successful energy initiative. But I wasn't very successful with it. Uh, iCampus freshman year, I mentioned this program called iCampus. So when we started iCampus, uh, again, this, again, think about SUTD. I said, why don't we take some of the resources from that. We had $25 million for educational initiative. Why don't we devote that to the freshman year at MIT and do innovation to the freshman year? You know, it could be uh, done in a variety of ways. Shortly thereafter, I had the Dean of Science and the, uh, uh, I think she was the, at that time, the, well, she was a Dean of something else, to her in my office and say, how dare you, Dean of Engineering, touch the freshman year because we scientists own the freshman year. I said, peace, I'm just trying to give you money and help you. <laughs> well, <laughs> peace was leave them alone, so I left them alone. <laughs> right, that was that. iFluids and curriculum uh, modularization, part of the iCampus program, we thought we have, at that time, I think we had something like uh, about 25 courses in fluids at the uh, undergraduate level, maybe undergraduate graduate level, given 
uh, in engineering, another dozen or so given in science. I said, you know, it seems to me we got too many courses. Why don't we create a set of modules that can be multi-purpose for many courses and so that we can get some synergies among these courses and the like. And so we had a, a, a group of our faculty working on this. Uh, again, never worked. Never worked, right? And again, I think you see some of that coming back to life at SUTD. So one nice thing about many of these failures is they resurrected themselves in other ways, right? In, in other lives, right? And the last one is, um, I would say, it was my worst, my worst professional moment ever. So I, I had uh, been on the faculty of the uh, School of Management at MIT. Uh, I had led about one-third of the School of Management, and the dean was stepping down, and uh, I was sort of thought of as good, the next dean. I mean, so everybody thought I was going to be the next dean, and uh, they had this process for doing it, and one afternoon I get a call from the provost, so he uh, wasn't in person, he called me and said, Tom, they chose somebody else. And I must say I was pretty devastated, pretty devastated. Right? So it was a, a rather dark moment. Now, if I had become dean, I never would have become dean of engineering, and I never would have been president of SUTD. So sometimes these things can work out, right? But I must say it was a dark moment, right, in terms of, you know, why am I doing all this, et cetera, et cetera. So we all have our failures. Hopefully we get through them and get over them, right, in terms of this. All right, enough of this gloom and doom. All right, this is... Uh, one of, one of the better moments that we have as dean, we do this here at SUTD as well, that's once a year we had something called Infinite Mile Awards, and we gave awards to staff who had excelled in various things throughout the school. You know, the school's quite big. It's uh, got 2,000 staff members, over 2,500 students and so on. So we'd have these awards. Uh, it was quite meaningful. They would bring families with them. Uh, there'd be flowers handed out and things of this nature. They'd uh, get some a monetary award, and then we'd have a picture every year for that. So. Uh, you, you know, there's occasions when these, uh, you know, arguing over hyphens can be very draining, but then having events like this where you celebrate the accomplishments of your colleagues is also quite a bit of fun. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of the uh, second to last segment here is Singapore and SUTD. So, you know that guy? <laughs> You've seen that guy? Yeah, you've seen him. Okay. So, uh, this handsome fellow, our current president, uh, with, is uh, quite involved with tr uh, certainly two programs, if not three programs, uh, that MIT has had with Singapore. Uh, the first is the Singapore-MIT Alliance. So uh, Dr. Tan approached MIT at one point, this was back in the 90s, 1990s, about uh, creating a MIT campus in Singapore. And MIT said, we don't do that, uh, we just have one campus. But what we will do is see if there's a working relationship with NUS and NTU. So we had a, a committee, I think it was 17 of us who came and did a, uh, actually an analysis and review of the engineering schools at NUS and NTU. Uh, and uh, you know, Bob Brown, who I mentioned, who was the, the dean at the time, and became provost, head of that group. Uh, Raphael Reif, who's the current president of MIT, was on that group. Uh, and as a result of that, we created something called the Singapore MIT Alliance which was a, uh, a, a program that had a, a, a five master's degree programs and research programs affiliated with them, both with NUS and NTU. And that program started just as I was becoming dean, so it reported to me as dean, and I used to come to Singapore a couple times a year. Um, sometime after that, John DeForge, are you here? John, are you here? You here? I don't know if you made it. Well, maybe you didn't make it. So. Uh, Sometime after that, uh, John DeForge was a colleague, MIT colleague. He and I went to visit with Dr. Tan uh, at the uh, Singapore Press Holdings. He was chairman of the Press Holdings at the time. And I'll never forget this day. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Th this is the third story. So the second story is uh, uh, Singapore decided it was going to create a research park called CREATE. You may be aware of CREATE. And it's a research park now that has a uh, fairly large number of signature foreign research universities do research there. It's MIT, it's Cambridge University, the Technion, uh, TU Munich, uh, ETH, et cetera, et cetera. But many uh, uh, signature universities. And um, uh, Dr. Tan came to us uh, and asked if we'd be interested in uh, uh, being the sort of the anchor client for that, right, and sort of creating this. Uh, so we worked with him and NRF at that time 
We actually chose the site. There were three different sites, and they asked us to choose the site. Uh, and I was stepping down as dean at that time. So I was involved in sort of the negotiations as dean, and then I became the first director of SMART. So that was uh, back in 2007, uh, 2007. And that's when I started my commute back and forth to Singapore, so my commute every month. And so what I used to uh, kiddingly say is, uh, and I was here about half the time MIT, half the time, so I was clearly semi-smart. Bad joke, bad joke. <laughs> maybe true, maybe true, but I was <laughs> semi-smart, semi-smart. Right, so now, now, the, now the third story. The third story is we go to visit him at Singapore Press Holdings, and um, uh, we're, we're actually going to ask him about uh, his advice and support about continuing SMA. And I'll never forget this. We're sitting at a sofa there, and he says, Tom, he says, the most uh, important thing that we're probably going to do in education, higher education in Singapore, over the next decade or two is create a new university. If I were MIT, I would think strategically about whether, and we're looking for a foreign partner, uh, and the foreign partner is gonna, has to provide the, the founding president. If I were MIT, I would think strategically and think about maybe uh, putting in a proposal for this. So there were two messages from that. One was SMA was not going to be renewed. He need not say that, but it was pretty clear it was not going to be renewed. Uh, and so uh, we went back uh, that evening. I sent a note to MIT, uh, thinking that MIT probably wasn't going to be particularly interested in that because they had decided before they weren't going to do this campus. And uh, fortunately or surprisingly, MIT expressed quite a bit of interest. All right, so we wrote a proposal. I wrote the proposal, uh, and then the, the rest is history. Right? And the proposal was basically, as you see, SUTD now. It's four pillars, the freshman year, all these type of things. So that was the story that got us to here. And here's just a, a couple of uh, figures. So this was signing of the uh, agreement. Susan Hockfield, president. Dr. Tam was there at the time, uh, the Minister of Education. Um, and this was the grand opening. Uh, so again, signature moments for us. I mean, it's groundbreaking, not the grand, the groundbreaking, sorry, groundbreaking. The groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, this is the groundbreaking. Uh, there's the high five. We had to get the high five in here somewhere, right? And of course, I had a, where's my Coke, by the way? That was my Coke, anyway. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> I didn't know if you'd recognize me without my Coke, right? right. So there's my Coke. Uh, and that, there's just yeah, some joyous pictures, right? Some pictures of uh, uh, the pioneers. I think that was, I think the top picture, Karina, I think that might have been a scholarship ceremony. Was that one of our scholarship ceremonies? That's the minister at uh, our first at our graduation, right? And I myself at the graduation. Yeah. These were joyous moments. I mean, signature moments in the life of SUTD, and I would say signature moments in my own life, of course, as well. All right, I'm going to uh, so let's just do a couple things here. I just want to acknowledge some colleagues. So the first two people on the top, Arnaldo Hawks and Steve Bradley, are my co-authors of my first book. Uh, I think it's fair to say I was the junior author, the younger author. It means I did all the work, ah, nah, but much of the work. <laughs> we'll get to that on the next line. So the next line is Ravi Ahuja and Jim Orlin. I was the senior author. Guess who did all the work? <laughs> <laughs> Tit for tat. Kent Bowen, uh, down, down below them, that's the guy on the left. Uh, he started this uh, Leaders for Manufacturing program with me. It's an interesting story with Kent. He was the engineering director of that program. I was the ma management school director. We started the program. We had great times working together. Then he went off to the Harvard Business School and joined the Harvard Business School, and I became Dean of Engineering. So we did a crisscross, which is pretty interesting. And that's Edward Crowley. So Ed and I started the System Design and Management Program. Ed most recently was the founding president of Skull Tech, a new university that MIT helped establish in China. Uh, Amadeo O'Donnell to the right. Uh, he's a, a faculty member in my own area operations research. We co-directed the MIT Operations Research Center for many years. Uh, up to top is Dick Yu, who was my associate dean when I was uh, dean of engineering, and Donna Savicki, who was the assistant dean. Uh, we did many, many, de uh, many of those deeds that I showed you that we did, we did co uh, collectively. And then John DeForge, bottom left, has uh, been actively involved working with me here in Singapore. So any, many of the successes or any of the successes that I've got, lots is due to these people. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to show you all this, but this is 
the leadership team here, right, has uh, expressed, uh, I think, as of last July or something. I'm not going to go through all that, but again, all the people here. All right, so now we come to, I think, what, what I'm supposed to do in some ways with this lecture and say something wise, right? <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But I hope that at least up to this is giving you some grounding. So what I say is going to be grounded on my experiences, uh, uh, grounded on my upbringing, and all these type of things, right, in terms of the, all these type of things. So whether I do this, whether I'm the Yoda and, and 900 years old or Obi-Wan, I don't know, right? But I often feel like I'm the Yoda <laughs> in terms of age. Maybe not in terms of wisdom, but in terms of age, right? So first thing I would say is I'm enormously proud to be an educator. I can think of nothing better to do with my life. Uh, I can think of nothing that's more important to society. Uh, I think that uh, education uh, provides uh, uh, an informed citizenry. It, in it fuels uh, social and economic prosperity. And I must say, one of the most delightful things in the world is having so many grandchildren, right? You, can, you are my grandchildren or great-grandchildren or something. It gives me enormous pleasure, and I hope, I hope uh, you understand that. It gives me enormous pleasure, right? Uh, and I think most of it, we educators feel the same way, right? I mean, it's, it's, there's a certain vibrancy that comes that having young people, uh, having this constant renewal of young people with ideas, with passions, with interests, with energy. But I'm very proud to be an educator. I, mean, I can't imagine myself, other than playing left field for the Boston Red Sox, <laughs> of doing anything else in the world, right? Uh, so I'm really very proud of that. Second is, um, uh, on, a, on a few occasions, when I was dean, I used to write a, a newsletter. I think I called it Engineering Our Future. And uh, it's intended to have two meanings. One, en engineering is our future, and we're going to engineer our future, right? So it's got two meanings. And I've also used the phrase engineering our world in the same way, engineering our world or engineering our world, or engineering exuberance in the same thing. And of course, we have here at SUTD a better world by design, right, in terms of thinking about the, the, the double meaning of that. It's a, we want to create a better world because we want to design a better world, and we're going to use design to do it in terms of this. So again, I'm, I'm uh, uh, very proud to be associated with this. I think it's uh, incredibly important for society uh, in terms of um, much of what we think about, again, is our economic or social prosperity comes from, from these type of things. Engineering also has been historically the road to upward mobility. If I can take myself in his, in his example, I remember, I remember all those uh, beginnings, right, when we had this budget and my uncle stepped in, my, in our, uh, th our thing, uh, when we, uh, you know, I bought clothes for the, the family in terms of the holidays. So to come from that kind of a background to then eventually become a, go to a, a top graduate school like Stanford, go a faculty member at MIT, become Dean of Engineering, become President of SUTD. Uh, you know, this is in some ways, at least up to the, this part, is the American dream right, in terms of that opportunity. And my hope is that you will have this similar Singapore dream, right, in terms of having opportunities, right, but being grounded in that and having those opportunities. And engineering, I think, has played an important role in that. All right, now I'm just going to do a few, a few things of uh, words of wisdom. You, I, it's hard to say these words of wisdom that haven't been said 10,000 times before in a variety of ways, but I'll say them anyway, right? So one is, find your way and your passion. Uh, I, in my life, found my way. So my way was as a professor, right? It's, it's something that, as I said, gives me enormous pleasure. I'm proud of it. Uh, I found my way in terms of optimization. I love optimization, love doing with optimization. But find yours, right? Find out what excites you, what's going to fuel your interests, what's going to fuel your passion, right? Uh, and it, uh, I must say, most of the young people are going to live to be 100, right, 100. You may find that you're going to have various moments in your life in which you're doing different things. You may be, your pathway may not be linear. It may, not, it may go up and down in a variety of ways. Rejoice in that in some ways, right, in terms of that. But find things that interest you, and it may be that 10 years from now, something different will interest you, right? But find you, you, you do the best in the world on things that you're passionate about things that you feel good about, all right? Uh, I feel good every morning when I get up and I come to university, all right? And I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm pleased to do it. Find something that you'll feel good about every day when you get up in the morning. Expect change. I've tried to paint this picture of change, right, over uh, my lifetime. Uh, and if, I, if we looked at 1945 and said, 
Will there be something called cell phones that we're all running around with, right? Uh, will there be something like, well, jet airplanes we might have said, right? Will there be something called the internet? I mean, this would uh, be unfathomable. This would really be science fiction to us at that time. So if you project out the next 20, 30 years in your lives, right, there's going to be things unimaginable to you, right? Just but expect change, all right? And you're going to have to work with that change in terms of a variety of ways. Uh, and one of the most pleasurable things for me, uh, and particularly in the workplace, and I, I put up these, pic these pictures of my colleagues in some ways, is enjoying being around people. Right? I mean, it's, just, it's fun to, to collaborate with people. It's fun to interact with people. I hope you find that in terms of your cohort classrooms and your fellow students. But I also hope you find that in your professional and personal lives as well, right? Uh, you know, really enjoy being around people, interacting with them, uh, learning from them, right? And maybe they're learning from you, uh, bringing different perspectives. So often, I show you some of these pictures up there. Uh, Donna Savicki, who was my assistant dean, was one of the few people when I was dean that would say, Tom, that's a dumb idea. That's a really stupid idea. Tom, why would you want to do that? Now, she would say it more gently than that sometimes, right? But it was very useful. It's very useful to have people around you, right, that can pr provide that kind of feedback to you, can work with you in a variety of ways. So enjoy people. Live honorably, right? We only live once, friends. We only live once, right? And we can live unhonorably, but live honorably in terms of your own sense of ethics, your own sense of being a good person. Uh, you know, we go through life once. We might as well do it in a way that we feel good about ourselves, right? We feel good about what we do in the world. Uh, we feel good about our interactions with people. We respect each other, right? And, uh, you know, I think one should respect. You walk around the university, we've got people doing all kinds of things. We respect everybody, right? So the people who are doing uh, some of the things that aren't uh, linked necessarily to the academic enterprise, they might be cleaning the rooms around us with all. These are, these are people who, uh, this is their professional lives, right? Respect them, right? They do, they do the, uh, they're doing things that are helping us to, to, uh, to uh, achieve what we want to achieve. And this is how they maybe feed themselves, feed their family, et cetera, et cetera. So respect everybody. Uh, you know, if you've got to live your life, live it with integrity, right? And, and so just you'll feel better about yourself, right? And when you get to be an old person like me and you look back and say, well, I think I led a pretty honorable life. I think I lived a pretty... Uh, 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 life in which I was, I think I was, had high integrity. You, f you just feel better about yourself. So, good. Uh, I, one of the things I've always found the most useful, uh, and as as an administrator, is listening. And one of the things I like to do often is when I'm in a meeting with people, I like to project what they're thinking about. So I'll sit there and say, you know, we're in this thing talking about something, trying to solve a problem, maybe even debating different points of view, saying, well, I suppose I were you, and you were having this meeting with me. What are you thinking about? And why are you saying what you're saying? Right? So just reflect upon that. And I've often found that's very useful, because once you take that perspective, you do listen. You can relate better to that person. You can uh, present your point of view uh, better to that person. Or maybe the, you understand that person's better in terms of their point of view, and you can use that to come to some agreement in what you do. So I think listening there is actually a very good skill, right? Uh, listening and then not only listening, but uh, help, help try to make sure that the people you're working with feel that you're working to try to make them successful as well as you successful, right? Uh, because typically we're in these organizations where success depends upon all of us, right? So uh, that you're listening to them, that you're listening to their ideas, and you want them to be successful in what they're doing. Laugh a lot. Laugh a lot. I try to laugh every day at the workplace and every day at home. Laugh about something, right? 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 So just, you know, come in and laugh. Laugh about yourself. Laugh about what you're doing. Uh, laugh about others around you. <laughs> laugh about presidential elections. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, see, it, you, I gotta laugh. <laughs> so laugh. I think laughing, laughing is important, right? Uh, and you know, and, and um, most of the things we do in life are not uh, life and death. You know, if I if I'm uh, doing something at the workplace, doing something at home, if, and if I screw up, and I screw up all the time, right? 
It's not the end of the world, right? You know, I, say, I try not to do it, try not to mess up, uh, but if you, you mess up, okay, let's get on with it. Let's maybe fix it if we can fix it. If we can't, let's fix it. But uh, there's very few things that we do in life that are life and death. And so, you know, if you take an exam, like my first exam and I get an F on it, you know, it didn't feel good, but it wasn't life and death, all right? And if I didn't get an A in that course, it's not going to affect my life really that much, right? So, again, try to put these things in perspective, laugh, right? You know, you do take things seriously, I think, uh, but not, none of it's life and death. None of it's life and death. All right, be inspired, right? And I'm going to show you a little bit about ins being inspired, right? Some ways that I'm, I'm inspired, right? First of all, I'm inspired by all of you. Yes, you inspire me. All right, here's some things I inspire. So Barbara Streisand and Linda Ronstadt inspire me, right? In fact, one of my most disappointing moments, or a couple of them at SUTD, is I'll ask the students, and sometimes even the staff, who's Linda Ronstadt? And they give me this blank look, who's Linda Ronstadt? Linda Ronstadt was one of the world's greatest singers. Fantastic singer, right? Uh, and Barbara Streisand, I think you maybe heard of Barbara Streisand? Yeah, okay. Well, so for my 50th birthday, my friends had a Barbara Streisand impersonator uh, come and uh, regale me, right? It was uh, actually quite nice. I wish they'd had Linda Ronstadt come <laughs> in person. All right, now the bottom, are I, I also get inspired by sports. I think you know I like sports. So that's Ted Williams, who used to play for the Boston Red Sox, perhaps the greatest hitter ever in baseball. One of my highlights of, as a youth, we made a trip from Syracuse, New York to, to uh, Boston to watch the great Ted Williams play baseball, two games in the weekend. Uh, the first game, he got no hits. Uh, the second game, there was a big sign up in the outfield, I remember to this day, Ted Williams, God's gift to baseball, and he got four hits that day. I was very, very happy as a youngster. Larry Bird, who you can, some of you might know, uh, played basketball. I was fortunate enough to have season tickets to the Celtics all during the year Larry Bird era. We got them just by luck the year he came. And uh, the year after we left, we gave them up because nobody wanted to go to the games anymore. Right? And then Tom Brady, who's currently the, uh, the quarterback of the, uh, the Patriots. But again, one can be inspired by many things, right? And in my sense, I'm, I'm inspired, inspired by excellence. So uh, Barbara Streisand or Linda Ronstadt singing or some artists that you might say are going to a play. You just can be quite inspired right, by these people in terms of their sense of excellence. Doing something I could never do, I could never do, but they're really great at it. Right? Same thing for these sports figures. All right, I'm, uh, I'm, an, I'm inspired by the movies right, in a variety of ways. So the top three movies I think are my favorite top comedies ever. Right? My favorite top comedies ever. Uh, my cousin Vinny. I don't know, anybody seen my cousin Vinny? Yeah, just faculty, just faculty. Okay, two of you. All right, how about, how about, uh, I'm sure no one has seen Bringing Up Baby, right? Bringing Up Baby is an old, old, old uh, Cary Grant uh, movie. Uh, and and uh, uh, Hepburn. Uh, and then A Fish Called Wanda. So people have seen Fish Called Wanda? Yeah, I hope. These are very funny movies, very funny movies. You can be inspired by them. I love cowboy movies, and actually, n until recently, I'd never seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? But I watch cowboy movies all the time. I just like them. I like this notion of people taking out these guns and spinning them and putting them in their holster. Just, I like them. And I'm always amazed by technology in movies. So when you go see a Star Wars movies or some of these movies, I don't go to all the ones you go to, the X-Men's and all these crazy things. But just, you know, the, the technical excellence in making these movies is quite extraordinary when you think about it, how these people go about it. I, it's, I think it's more extraordinary for me than it is for you because you can do some of this stuff, right? And for me, to get on my computer and you know, do build some of these things or create some of these things, impossible. But you can do some of it. So for me, it's maybe more inspiring than for you. Okay, All right, and this is the last thing. And they have, I'm quite serious. This is my son. And my son is the most inspiring thing in my life. So this is a picture of him. The first top three are 20 years ago. He loves Disney World, right? So we've probably been to Disney World or Disneyland in the U.S. probably 15 times, right? Maybe 20 times. And we go down there. You know, he can't. He can't drive. It's, it's him in his wheelchair. Uh, and uh, but we can get in these little cars that you know that go on automatically. And so he gets behind the wheel. He thinks he's driving. He has a great time. Really enjoys it immensely. 
it's us being literally being goofy, right? <laughs> literally being goofy, right? <laughs> uh, being goofy. All right, this is him and his uh, birthday party this year at our house. And this was him two weeks ago for Halloween, right? So he was Batman for Halloween. So the thing I'd just like to mention about him is, uh, one, he's a very, very happy person. Uh, he o he's almost always smiling, almost always smiling. Uh, he's, qu he's pretty limited in what he can do. So he functions as maybe about a, uh, a seven or eight year old mentally. He's got a bit of a garbled uh, speech, so it's hard to understand him all the time. Very limited use of his left hand. But he's happy, he's kind, he's generous, he enjoys life immensely. I mean, he and I do sports, uh, he travels with us and all these type of things, right? But when, you know, when, when things get a little bleak or you start to think about something's not going right, I just reflect on him, right? Reflect on him. I mean, here's this kid, right? Uh, and, you know, on occasion he's a little frustrated, but mostly he says, you know, I can do it. Dad, I can do it. Uh, I can do this, I can do that, right? And so uh, it's really, uh, again, personally to me, uh, and I hope this isn't modeling in your sense, but it's really quite inspiring. I think quite inspiring to him in that. Uh, this is him. Uh, he can't stand, so we have to prop, the, prop him up. But this was back again in 1995. He loves Elvis. And so this is, uh, he, for Halloween that year, he was Elvis. Uh, he, by the way, he loves orangutans. And so we, when he, he comes to Singapore. I think he's going to be here in January. And so we go breakfast with the orangutans with him. I should have brought maybe a picture of that with us here as well. Uh, so he's got, I think, 30 stuffed orangutans at home. One of them is about this big, right? So the kid, lo he just loves life, right? He loves life in a variety of ways. All right, so uh, now these have been I get my final two slides, right? So these have been thoughts about it from an old man, right? You're not really an old man. And this sort of reflects that, you know. I, I'm not quite at DOS at this point. But uh, I can't say I'm at the bleeding edge of technology. Uh, Rebecca's here someplace, I think. And whenever I have problems, Rebecca fixes my technology problems for me, right? Because I can't always fix them that way. So you know, take this in the context of somebody who's been around a long time, maybe is affected in some ways by some of the things we've done. And that's it, folks.